me just timer. All right. Hello, and welcome to episode eleven of the Peter Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, reporter Taylor Clydesdale. With me today is uh, reporter Todd Van Donk, and uh, and I'm Dan Hennessy. Yeah, why don't you introduce yourself uh, a little bit? Uh, community activist, agitator, uh, involved with Carol's Place, trying for the formation of a 24-7 community hub that's a safe, inclusive place for all. Uh, have a Facebook page, Peter Rose Street Voice, a lot of poverty and marginalization and addiction issues on it. And I guess that's what we're here today to talk about. Yeah, you got a lot on your plate, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're here because... Uh... You recently lost a friend. Uh, recently lost one friend, but in the last year I've lost ten. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff Stewart passed away just recently uh, from an opioid overdose. Uh, it should have been completely preventable. It's We all have hurdles to face. I know he was a drug user, but he was an experienced drug user. He just ingested poison is the only way to say it. What uh, what was Jeff like? What kind of person was Jeff? Uh, Jeff was a great guy. He was always friendly, always talked to people, uh, extremely talented musician. Uh, Todd had met him on numerous occasions. He was always... I think they refer to him as the piano man online. Yeah. He had a love for, love for music. I, I actually did follow him on Facebook and you know, he had plenty of po posts where he was uh, playing the piano and just had, had a love for music. Yeah. yeah, he was always truthful and forthcoming about the battles he faced up until the time of his passing. It's, uh, I can speak to that a little too. Uh, I met Jeff through you uh, at uh, Pivotal Square. Then I briefly probably spoke to him about, uh, I don't know, I think 10, 15 minutes and we left uh, on a note where he gave me his number and his Facebook contact and said he would like to be interviewed at some point. But uh, part, of, uh, part of that was that he would not be interviewed until he was clean. And that comes back to his honesty. And uh, about, I think about a month ago, I had sent him a message on Facebook saying, you know, we're looking for a positive story, somebody that, uh, that has been through the battle and is clean. And, he was honest with me saying, Todd, I'm not there yet, and he declined to do the interview. And, you know, since then I've talked to him a few times. He sends me, he was sending me jokes and stuff like that, and then I got the message from you the Friday morning that, uh, that he had died. And he was part of uh, a warning that police sent out on uh, Saturday morning. Uh, he wasn't alone. There was two others that uh, died over the weekend, too. Uh, as a result of, uh, uh, as you called it, poison, carfentanil, fentanyl, whatever it might have been, but uh, obviously uh, drugs that were were laced with uh, the powerful opioid. Yeah, that's I, I didn't know that you had been in touch with him and that uh, his commitment to being clean before he would share his stuff, that's, mm. that's some powerful stuff. It is, yes. And just scrolling through his Facebook post too, since he's died, I think one of the most powerful things I read is a post from a woman that says, eight years ago today, I was binge drinking away my weekends, losing myself to my addiction. I was in a dark place and couldn't see a way out and I was losing hope. God had been planting seeds along the way and my friend Jess Stewart contacted me, telling me he had God and sober. He shared the truth, the hope he had found again and it inspired me to face my addiction and Jeff is one of the reasons why I'm sober today. And I think that speaks volumes to the person Jeff was. Jeff was. Yeah. And J Jeff had been to rehab before and detox, and he was always forced to leave Peterborough, his home, his community. It's because there are no supports mm -hmm. in Peterborough for people to get clean or to stay clean. It's like you go to go away for thirty days to detox or rehab, and then you come back and you have no supports. It, he'd stay clean for a little while. And then just the lure of the poison that draw him back in. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And I think when I first met him with you, it was about, uh, I would say, less than a month after he had returned from the detox center in North Bay, I believe, is where yeah. where he was last, his last stent at a rehab center was in North Bay. Uh, and this is, it's just an ongoing battle. We have to, I have to give my friends as much support as I can in a non-judgmental way. It's like, I travel with an naloxone kit. It's... It should be more widespread. There should be greater access to it. There should be outreach workers going into these crack houses or drug dens, shooting galleries. It's like more people should get training. It's easy. It's nasal spray now. It's There's no adverse effects to naloxone. It's if the person's passed out and there's evidence of drug paraphernalia, maybe that person has OD'd. It's, this cannot hurt you. It's, if you're not under the influence of opiates, it won't do anything. Now, on the car ride over, you had mentioned that you feel that there's something missing from these kits. The, the opioid test strips? There, yeah, there should be fentanyl test strips av available. It's, I've researched them online. It's, they're readily available. I do not know why fentanyl test strips are not included in harm reduction kits. It's, I'm not kidding myself. I know the person will still use it if it's fentanyl, because they want that high, they want to feel good about themselves. It's, but they might use with a friend. Don't use alone. It's, uh, there's fentanyl test strips information on Facebook page, Peterborough Street Voice. Uh, there needs to be a greater awareness and a push from the government to supply funding for fentanyl test strips. They're just little chemical strips that test the pH. And, you, and you've seen them in uh, other provinces out west, I believe. They're yeah. readily available out west. And, and they might come in place when, uh, when the Peterborough uh, temporary overnight uh, uh, site opens in Peterborough. Yeah. They might become available then. Uh, again, though, this is harm reduction strategy. It doesn't get to the root causes. No. Uh, what do you think is the main thing we need here in Peterborough. We need a safe, inclusive place where people can go and get recreational activities, whether that be playing cards, whether that be able to talk to somebody at all hours of the day. Uh, one of the big drivers of addiction is people living alone in a rooming house. They're locked in a little room, they, they're bored, they're lonely, uh, social inclusion is huge. It's like, I'm not saying it would have prevented Jeff's death, but if he had a place to go and somebody to talk to and play the piano and just talk to people and be included rather than living in a rooming house, which is a horrible way to live. Loneliness, fear, boredom. Addiction is a, is a socially isolating activity? Yeah, it's like... I don't know if I have the right answers, It's, but I think I have some answers, and we need this now. We need a safe injection site now. It's. I know some of my friends would use it. It's. And I've wrote about the issue and, and have spoke to, to users, and, and the consensus is, is that they would use them. Um, and online, a lot of conversation is driven to that temporary overdose, sure, it's a Band-Aid solution again, and that we should be more focused on funding for a rehab center in Peterborough. Absolutely, and it, but it's a necessary Band-Aid. Oh, well, for like, sure. It is. If, if you cut yourself, you put yes. a Band-Aid on it because yes. it's needed. Yes. It's This is needed. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. But harm reduction and, and this problem, you know, uh, was sparked out west in Vancouver a long time ago, and guess what? They're... You know, their deaths keep rising, and, and obviously they haven't found the solution, and they have five times more harm reduction strategies than, than we here have locally. So it's, you know, it is, as I said, it is needed, but it, it's not the answer. No, but we need to find new and innovative ways of dealing with addiction issues, whether that be a 24-7 community hub where people can come and feel safe and, and be engaged and do things they like, to get out of living in room, rooming houses where there's so much despair and we need to engage with people in a safe, all-inclusive 
manner where people aren't ostracized because they're a typical drug user. It's there's huge. You keep going back to that social element, that 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 stigmatization that, that's a part of it. That you know, when you are addicted, when you're in these rooming houses, when you've got no one around you, that drives that addiction. That is that that's yeah. the case. Well, that's not the only case. That's one of the cases. Okay. I think the addiction is what drives the addiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it doesn't help when you're bored and have nobody around. And I think looking at even going through Jeff's Facebook, you, you could see all of his posts. It's him by himself. Yeah. You know, in a little, you know, I think he was living in a one bedroom apartment. I'm not 100% sure where he was. No, he was in a room. He was in a room, yeah. Of him by himself in a room. Yeah, like I dropped off a turkey for him from you guys mm -hmm. for your great turkey drive. And it's like it was a shared house. It's like for somebody to have Christmas dinner alone. Yeah. It's like that's not a nice thing. That mm -hmm. drives despair. It's. And I think a lot of it too is is the stigma, as, as Taylor mentioned, is that there's a horrible stigma around that. You know, all drug users, you know, yeah. chose to do the drugs, and but you we, don't know the reason why they got addicted to drugs in the first place. No. And that could be many a reasons. It could be yeah. a back injury from work. Yeah. It could be you were sexually assaulted as a kid your whole life, and it's a way to mask the pain. Um, there's so many different no. reasons. You and know? like until we have a place where somebody can come in and talk and feel comfortable talking about what happened in their past, mm -hmm. and there's nothing like that available in Peterborough now. Mm -hmm. It's people don't like normal counselors. Like you go and see forecasts maybe once a month and talk about your problems for mm -hmm. 45 minutes, and and then you don't see yeah. that person again for another month. Yeah. Like. There's there's no trust there. It's they go because they're trying to get help and they're screaming out for help. But the long wait list, even to get into a program like that, it's that maybe that person wants help and to get clean right away, but they need help and they can't get it. They're forced to leave their community to go to a detox, detox or rehab for thirty days, and then they're returned to the community. And well, because they have don't have those support yeah. systems in the community, they. The yeah. relapse is, is chances high. Yeah, it was very high. And you and you see that too with uh, you know, the marginalized that that go into to, to jail. They you know they get released at the bus stop after they've served their time, or and again they're back right where they started with no resources. And the often the first thing they do when they get off that bus is go look for the next fix or or a way to find money, which you know yeah. may include a, a, you know a small petty crime like. You know, stealing or something like that, or it's or panhandling. But they're right back where they started. They're not better off for being in jail. They're, and it is just right back where you started. No, and yeah. it's it's a vicious wheel that has to get smashed. It just mm -hmm. keeps going around and repeating itself. That's why we have to find new and different ways of dealing with our friends. It's. I think the one thing too, going back to the stigma and just knowing stories, like I. Looking at Jeff, Jeff's Facebook and his picture, one of his main pictures is, uh, I'm guessing, a picture when he was at a better place. And it's, you know, I can I show it to, to the viewers? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can put something on the, the screen as well. So, yeah, 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 well, I can show it. Just This is Jeff, I imagine, when he's healthy before his addiction started. He looked like a healthy young man that was an athlete at some time. And then if you scroll back through to what he looks like before he overdose is that's Jeff days or uh, months before he overdosed. And you can obviously tell the difference, uh, the weight loss, uh, the rotting teeth, uh, just all the things that come with uh, being a drug user. So, you know, Jeff. At some point, I imagine, you know, in high school, he, was, he looked like he was a strapping young man with, you know, a lot of potential. And like, he attended the Royal Conservatory of Music. It's like he was an extremely accomplished musician. Uh, he enjoyed fishing. There's lots of his fishing pictures on his Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's like he had hobbies. Mm -hmm. And this isn't uh, someone that, you know, wasn't out to seek help to... Yeah and his addiction. This was someone that was actively trying to, yeah. to deal with their problem. 
It's, he just needed help. It's, it's, he wanted to kick the habit. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's just a struggle every day. It's, no, it seemed like he passed on, along his want for help, but also maybe put himself behind by trying to help others as yeah, well. It seems it's, from reading all the messages about like him trying to help others yeah, with their addictions too. Like everybody you talk to, they've got good stories about Jeff, funny stories. Mm -hmm. It's like he was loved by all. It's he's not, you know, to these people, he wasn't just an addict. He was, he was a human he, being. He was he, a friend. He was a friend. It's. Like, he was an amazing human being. It's like he tried helping people. It's like he talked to him downtown. It's like he, some days he'd have money, he'd buy people a coffee, talk to them. It's, you will not find somebody that had a bad word to say about Jeff Stewart. It's like he had demons that he had to battle, but he was a friendly, likable guy. It's, and he's going to be so missed. It's, and that's why... We need more support so that you yeah, know, it's, we don't lose more friends. Like I battle this every day with agencies, and it's like try to get them to do more. It's like it's just the whole poverty industry. It seems the poverty industry. It's like they don't want to commit to actual help because then if they get people off drugs, then they're losing their client base, and then there's going to have to be layoffs and. Like, I never used to believe that a poverty industry existed. Now I do. It's, like, if everybody got off drugs tomorrow, Forecast would shut down. Yeah. It's Forecast and CMHA, they're big employers in Peterborough. Before we sign off, you had mentioned that you had come some kind of social hub for people in, in the town uh, would be very beneficial. But is there anything else that you'd like to see in Peterborough to help people? I, who are in need like I Jeff would, was. I would like to see a, a rehab detox center in Peterborough that does not have four month waiting lists. It's like people should not be forced to leave their communities to seek help. Like their supports, whatever supports they have, whether it be family, whether it be friends. It's like if somebody has to go up to North Bay for three months to go through detox and rehab, well then they're even more socially isolated. It's So that's a big detriment to people leaving the community. You're not getting those visits yeah. from, from family members. So and, some yeah. of my friends would like to go to detox or rehab, yeah. but they choose not to because they've got to leave their community. Yeah. Yeah. Another big thing it's, is being away from children too. Yeah. Right? Is, yeah. You have children and you go away for three months and you're not near your children, that, that fight's just as hard. Or being in the hospital for any reason. If you're in the hospital for, for chronic sickness and you're in there for a long time and no one comes to visit you, of course you're going to feel no, cold no. and isolated and alone. And that goes the same for a rehab center. Yeah. And like, people miss their friends, they miss their family, so maybe they might leave rehab early. Maybe they didn't get all the help they needed to. Yeah. And so they voluntarily sign out without completing their whole course and they'll be good for four, five, six months, but then they slip back. Well, maybe if they just had to stay that extra week, they would have learned those coping skills. It's... We do, and we, you know, we do have uh, a facility here in Peterborough that it's... It's privately funded and it costs a, for, a yeah. fortune to do, you know, to, to go. So unless you unless you have money, you know, you're you're yeah. kind of out of luck, right? Um, but the model they seem to have seems like a model that works uh, in other parts of the country, uh, in Portugal, for example, where you know drugs are decriminalized yeah. and you know their their goal is is not not to arrest or charge or to label them you know as an addict it, you know it's a disease to them mm -hmm. and their rehab is strictly focused around healthy eating exercise socializing mm -hmm. and you know and that's when they're at these facilities that's what they're doing they're exercising eating properly and mingling with other people that you know have similar problems to them and then the success rate of putting them back in the community is overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and, but 
is that is that a point you think we're at where the government starts needs to start looking at as complete decriminalization uh, as an option? The stats from these countries don't lie. It's mm -hmm. I'm not a politician. I don't drive social policy. It's I'm not smart enough to say that for sure. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be looked at. Yeah, and it's, I think that that's my view, my viewpoint of it too. Like when you look at the stats, and it's just hard to hard to argue how yeah. this isn't a, a possible solution. And but the my final thing that I'd like to say, it's if you're an opiate user, do not use alone. Use with a friend. If you're friends with opiate users, Parn offers free naloxone training. Uh, the health unit offers free naloxone training. Uh, the kits are free. Uh, there's no stigma attached to getting a kit. It's there should be more training. More people should be trained in it. Uh, you could save somebody's life, and that's it. Yeah, that's what it all boils down to: is yeah. saving lives. All right, Dan. Thank you very much okay. for being on the show. Thank we you. appreciate you coming on here. Thank, thank you, sir. And uh, to everybody else, we will see you next week.